last month we were talking about the mantle of a growing church. However, this month we want to make sure now we become active members. One of the points in the sermon was that in the mantle of a growing church, each member does their part. This month is going to be a game changer. Look at your neighbor and say game changer. Because I believe as I've prayed and as I've tried to listen to God, this month is going to determine whether our church continues to grow and gets into greater heights with a stronger anointing, a stronger move of the spirit, with more life change, or our church starts to go south. I have too much faith in you to know that you listen to the voice of God for us to make sure the church grows. And what do I mean? Because this month, we are going to put into practice and strongly make sure that we become active members. This coming Sunday, every one of you is expected to bring at least one extra person. At least one extra person. The chair that you are sitting in, a new person is going to sit there. We're going to add more chairs. We're going to create more capacity. And next week's service is going to be different in that those people that you have brought who don't know Christ, we're going to preach that they get saved. And next week, I'm going to move more into ministering praying for people by the gifts of the Spirit and praying for deliverance. Because if we don't do that, all that God wants to do in this church is not going to happen. So I'm talking to you soldiers as your captain. And to say, Gini Mabuto. This week. Bring one or two people. Next week, Sunday, in all our churches, all of them, with 30 something of them, you know, how many are we? 30, whatever. 38 of them. In all the 38 churches, this is, we don't count this one because this is the mother church. So this is the big in Lovugas, this one here. At level in in Lovugas. It's a big in love, at level in love. So in all our churches, we're going to have next week Sunday as a bring a soul Sunday or a swelling Sunday. We want to double our attendance. Uh, you see now, Lavana Yanong, you are I don't know what kind of soldiers you are. You're not even saying amen. And not only that, Bazalana, next week Sunday at one o'clock. In the afternoon, we are dedicating our church in Kibla Park. We have a new site there. We have a structure there. That's not, that's not complete. We bought it like that. But it also has several classrooms that we can immediately use for our church. But we're going to dedicate that. We are, what we're doing is we are clearly stating we believe in what God has assigned us to do. And everybody, every soldier is going to get busy. Every one of us, we're going to put our hands to the plow. Are we going to do that next week, Basalan? In 1 Timothy 4, 7, listen what Paul says to Timothy. And this is going to be the theme that runs through this month. He says, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, uh, no, not in the way mouth, uh, oh, you got it. Okay, yeah, King James. But, no. <laughs> oh, bless them. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Let's see the Weymouth translation. What does it say? But worldly stories fit only for credulous old women have nothing to do with them or have nothing to do with. But I want to go back to the King James Version where it says, exercise yourself in godliness. 
This month is a month where you and I are going to exercise ourselves in godliness. I want to meet, I want to also read 1 Timothy 4.15 in the King James and I'll go back to verse 7 of exercising ourselves in godliness. Listen what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.7. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them. Tell your neighbor, give yourself holy. <laughs> Tell your other neighbor, give yourself holy. So, so this month, it's a month where the theme is give thyself holy, exercise yourself in godliness. When you give yourself holy is when you throw yourself to God's command. It's where you carry out God's instructions with every fiber of your being. This month, I'm calling upon the cold Christian to change that temperature and be the hot Christian. I'm calling upon the passive Christian who has only been a spectator in our church to be an active participant and be a Christian who will give themselves holy. Why? Because I know prophetically that this month is going to be a determiner of how far we go as a church. And what God does, not only among us corporately, but inside of us individually. That takes me back to verse 7, where itself, train yourself in godliness. That word train is the Greek word gumnazo. It's G-U-M-N-A-D-Z-O, gumnazo. Train yourself in godliness. And that word gumnazo is where we derive the word gymnasium. Gymnasium. And the origins of that word is that remember when Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy was very much ministering among a Greek-speaking people. In the Greek world and in the Greek nations of the world, these are people who really prided themselves in how they looked physically. Many of you have seen some of the portraits and some of the sculptures from the Greek world. I mean, they sculpt people who, have, who are very muscular when you look at them. Because the Greeks were very, very intent on building their bodies up. They boasted about their looks. They loved to be involved in sports, in games, in athletics, and they were a very competitive people. And this is why Paul borrows from this practice. This word exercise, please don't blush. I'm going to read what it means. It portrays, it is used to portray a naked athlete who was trained and prepared for competition in the athletic games of the ancient world. So when they went to the gymnasium, they would take their clothes off, not to engage in any evil, but when they took their clothes off, they were going in there to be trained and saw that as they engaged in athletes in fighting, their opponent, their enemy had nothing to hold on to to subdue them. So they would shed off what they had on so that it eliminates the possibility of them being impeded in their movements and being held down and strangled by the other athletes. And so when they went in, their trainer would train them. Not only would their trainer train them very hard, and very strongly, their trainer would also anoint their whole body with oil so that they became slippery. Now, that may sound quite snarks in the natural sense. But in the spiritual sense, what it means is this. If we are to engage in warfare, we must shed off things that hinder us. You can never effectively stand against the power of Satan when you have things that Satan can hold on to to your life. 
We've got to shed off unforgiveness, shed off bitterness, shed off sinful living, shed off that. And when you have shed off, only then can you have the anointing oil come upon you. And when the anointing oil comes upon you, when Satan tries to wrestle you, he can't wrestle you because you are slippery. Am I talking to people in the house? And so Paul says to them, train yourself. He uses that word. Train yourself. He's saying, this is time for you to get ready to shut off things that are wrong. For some of you, you should shut off passivity. For some of you, it's to shut off the ability and the attitude of being spectators. It's to shut off this attitude of you not telling others about Jesus. It's to shut off prayerlessness, to shut off sinful living, to shut off all those things. Why? Because God, who is our trainer, God, who is the Holy Spirit, who is our trainer, wants to pour the oil on you. I see the oil of God upon your life and moving you to another level. But make sure the enemy doesn't have anything to hold on to. And show of everything. So this month, Barcelona, this is the month where we're going to throw away things that are hindering us. Kick away things that are excuses. Throw away the issue of being a spectator Christian. Just coming to church to listen to the sermon and going home and saying, oh, we are Shumailu Bishop and doing nothing about it. Look at your neighbor. Already. But this is the month. Somebody say, give thyself holy. Exercise yourself in godliness. So this month, Bazalana, as we start, I'm going to share with you about soul winning. Why is it important for us to do soul winning? Why, why must you bring somebody next week? And as we bring them, I want to make you aware, I promise you, we're going to preach the gospel to them. They're going to get saved. They're going to get healed. They're going to get delivered. But remember, the move of God, when it happens, it will not only touch them, it's going to touch you, athlete. And take you athletes to another level. In Matthew 28 verse 19, Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Somebody say all nations. How many nations? How many nations? I can't hear you. How many nations? All nations. All nations. So Jesus is commissioning us. To teach all nations. God's vision is a big vision. Sometimes as churches, as denominations, our great mistake is that when we are full like this, we have a tendency to think everybody has been reached by the gospel. The truth is this, Barcelona, we are a very small fraction compared to the people out there who are not saved. Even if our church was to be a church of a hundred thousand people, which is what I'm believing God for. Even if it were to be a church of a hundred thousand people, if so were to only had a population of a million people, that would only be just 10%. 10%. Now we know statistically that Soweto has a population of three million people. So even if it were to be a church of a hundred thousand people, you can have ten churches that have a hundred thousand people and still reach only one third of the population in Soweto. So let's not let our large churches fool us. There's still a lot of people out there that have not been reached by the gospel. Look at your neighbor and say, you are so serious today, Shem. So Jesus says, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what we're going to do, Barcelona, after Good Friday, all these people who will have gotten saved from this coming Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Sunday, the week after Good Friday, we're going to baptize all of them. All of them. All of them. Why, Barcelona? Because the last two years, the church has not been able to do what it should do. The last two years, people have defected to all kinds of things. 
The last two years, the church has been docile. The church has not been doing what it should be doing. If there's a, if, if there's a time when you and I should really be going after people who are lost, it is now. Because when you look around, there's a lot of people who have lost their way. Even some of the Christians have lost their way. And it's time for you and time for me to bring a soul next week Sunday. So that we can preach the gospel to them. So Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Proverbs 11.30. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. If you win souls, you are wise. I said, if you win souls, you are wise. What is a soul? Well, a soul is something that God looks at with a lot of seriousness. Because in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, which is the verse we're going to work with, Jesus says, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But Alana, let's not kid ourselves. God looks at the wellness of our soul. According to God, when we leave this world, the first question God asks is that where did their soul go? Now, I know in the world, you know, we, 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 we talk about certain things and highlight certain things and, and celebrate certain things. We like to celebrate wealth, success, fame, popularity, education. We celebrate all those things, beauty, looks, you know, people like to look nice. Nice, all right to look nice. Tell your neighbor, you look nice. Yeah. It's all right to look nice, Basala. It's all right to have money. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the reality. The day we leave this world, it's going to be all about our souls. You see, death is the equalizer. That's where no matter what you have, we're all equal at death. That's why when Jesus talked about Lazarus and the rich man, both of them died. Everybody dies. Rich or poor, everybody dies. And when everybody dies, everybody after they die, once you leave your body, you go into eternity. Either to heaven or to hell. One of the two places. And there, everything we have on earth doesn't matter. There's no issue what color you are, how old you were. There's, there's no, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you had, what you didn't have. On the other side of the earth, we are all equal. And the only thing that God's going to ask is that, are you born again? Yeah. So let's not kid ourselves because, you know, we can put so much effort into worldly things, and sometimes we may be really impressed. You know, sometimes at a funeral, Yamoto, and you see this long motorcade. All the latest cars that you can ever find. And a limousine of a hess in front. And a casket in there. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we can come to the occasion and speak about the person and eulogize a person and say all kinds of nice things. That's what we do this side of the world. But on the other side of the world, there's a different question that gets asked. On the other side of the world, there's a different reference point. On the other side of the world, there's a different scale that is used on the other side of the world. And Jesus says, what does it profit you? To be praised by men, to be loved by people, to be respected by people. What does it profit you? To gain the whole world and be the toast of everybody. And yet the day you leave this world, you lose your soul. What does it profit you? God help us as preachers that we don't let people escape this truth. That when we stand in our pulpits, we preach this truth. God help us not to have the blood of people on our hands. To tell people, let it be the people who will reject it. But we must tell you the truth. What does it profit? To gain the whole world. And lose your soul. Because all of us, even if you deny it, even if you think it's, it's just a story, all of us 
We are going to face God one day. Yeah. What does it profit? What does it profit? What does it profit? What does it profit? You know, Zalana, I don't know how to say this, but when I say it in a way, you'll understand me. If you are to reach, meet the richest people in the world and have a conversation with them, you'll know that they will try and tell you, Hori, don't, be ki- don't kid yourself. Money can't give you contentment. Now, it's, it's hard to believe that when, when you haven't had ma- a lot of money. It's difficult to believe that. It's difficult to believe that. But they will tell you, money can never buy you contentment. Money can never buy your soul. Because live on the day they die. We are called Runeva Ruth. Why? Because there are some who are lucky that before they die, they cannot see what's going on the other side. Not everybody is that lucky. There are some people who die without realizing, ah, Rosasala, the other side. Go and say, John. But there are those who are lucky. Somehow God gives them grace. And if you've ever, ever had to pray with people who are at that time of death, which I've done a couple of times, and if you ever spend time with them, it's a, it's a different it's a different time, Baza. Oh, that time. <laughs> it's a different time. People have another. They don't care. They don't care how they look. They don't care how they sound. They don't care about being proper. They are desperate. They are desperate. They they are desperate. Ba ba hoblel. Ba tan salidi piri ba tan din sare. Hey, kiko palen sarel. Kiko palen this list mama lim lela. I'm sorry. It's a it's a time of truth. Yeah. Unfortunately, others are not ready for God. But you see the other side. I remember the one relative we went to pray for, Lima Bishop. This person would even rub their eyes. Rub their eyes. They, they would see into the other world. It's like there's a period where they can see the other world and they see you and they see the other world. So who would talk when people don't know the Bible? They don't know what they're seeing. They, they don't know what to make of it. It's, it's a scary thing. To reach that moment, and unfortunately, the truth was not preached to you. Or maybe you didn't want to believe the truth. You didn't want to read the Bible. You, 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 you busied yourself with other things. Because that day does come. And it doesn't come to old people. We are burying young people even today. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus asked that question, what will it profit? What will it profit you, my brother? What will it profit you, my sister? What will it profit you, young men, young women? What will it profit you to have a good report and a great report and all the accolades on this earth and everybody celebrates you? But the difference is on the other side, there's no celebration. It's just for here on earth. Because it's not our good works that will get us to heaven. So what people say about us. The only door is the one that God has made. What will it profit? And Jesus talks about this thing called soul. What is a soul? The word soul there is used in different ways. But it refers to the human life or the totality of your being. The core of you you are. That's the word soul. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It speaks of the word soul. It is that part of you, when it leaves your body, death occurs. That's the soul. It's that immaterial part of you, that unseen part of you. It is that part of you that when God made man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It is the soul that gives life to your body. When it leaves your body, your body can't live anymore. It is that part of you that comes from the insides of God. For that matter, it's an eternal part of you. Which means, when I go higher, when we say you are dead, we don't mean how salite. You are still there, but in another place. When somebody dies, the word death in Bible terms means separation. 
When somebody dies, it's when the soul and the body separates. The body is taken to the graveyard, but the soul goes to the other side of the world. And there's two places on the other side of the world is where God is and where the devil is. You can gain the whole world, but there comes a time when you go on the other side. You know, sometimes I think about it. Every day I pray, when I pray, I say, God, please, I don't want to go to hell. Because the problem is, once the soul is in hell, hell is a place of pain. It's a place of destruction. But the problem is, you don't ever get finished. You live forever. You experience pain and hurt and condemnation, being away from God forever. And the problem is, in hell, you remember. You still can think. You still can recognize people. You'll remember. You'll know about your life. You'll know why you are there. You'll be there. That's why God sends us to preach to the nations. Tell the nations. Because God doesn't want people to go there. Because there are people who pass on without being aware. See, so Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 12. He talks about this guy who's worked all his life. And he's made a plan to say, I'm going to work hard. And then I'm going to retire to enjoy what I have done. And then I will say to my soul, rest also. And Jesus says, but heaven said, you fool. Don't you know that tonight... Your soul will be required of you. Turn to it, Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said to him, you foolish one, tonight, tonight, I will take your soul from you. And who then will be the owner of all the things which you have gotten together? Yeah. Because there are people who, in fact, statistics do show that most people who die, died without being aware they're going to die. Next week. I know I've heard stories some places husband and wife go to bed in the morning one of them wakes up tries to wake up their spouse they think they've overslept only to find their past the night before they didn't say I'm going to die during the night something that I've always told you and I'll never forget this and I'll repeat it for as long as I live, because it changed my perspective about life. You know, there are certain things when you see a, a moment of death has a way of redefining your life. I'm telling you. Yeah, some of you haven't come close enough to death. Maybe not dying yourself, but seeing death happen. If you see it happen, you, you will never be the same. I'm telling you. I saw a young man being crushed by a train to death when I was 18 years old. I never forget that. This young man, when I was a lot of stuff more training. And the train was pulling out of the platform and he tried to jump into it, he missed the step, fell between the train and the platform. And the train started spinning him because it was moving forward, it started spinning his head being bashed. I still remember today the last words this young man spoke when he cried, Ma! See, when you're in that condition, you don't care about my susu. No, how not I don't tell you what means I know how because it comes from the heart. You are facing reality. How not to date? I still remember. I, I couldn't take my eyes off. There were several of us who were watching this. We watched in horror this young man being crushed to death. Crushed. Finally, he fell underneath the platform and they brought him out, blamed the young man, eyes gray, body totally crushed, clothes torn. On. And I thought, I'm sure her Natsamaya, he told his friend, Joe, it's your spin. It's your spin. But heaven said, tonight. How ready are you? Never go to bed without being ready. Never leave the house without being ready. Never stay a moment without being ready because you don't know the hour. What shall a man give in exchange of his soul? And it's that part 
that makes us the living soul, that makes us a living being. It's man's immaterial nature, man's invisible part. So the soul is eternal because it lives beyond the grave. And that's the part that God is concerned about. That's the part that is so much of value. So in Matthew 16, 26, we note the following things about the value of your soul. Write them down. Number one, your soul is more valuable than the world and its possessions. And this is why I was like, ah, please don't misunderstand me. I, I count myself and, and those who are preachers, I, I, I count as the most privileged people to be called by God and trusted by God to labor in an area which is the only area that our labor will go beyond this earth and stretch into eternity. Because through us making altar calls, preaching, showing people God's way if they respond and they receive Christ, thank God the fruit of that we will see it in heaven. But with every other industry, everything we do, once we die, if a lamb doesn't cross to the other side. It's a privilege to work for God. It's a privilege. And it's the same privilege I'm extending to you next week. That next week you bring somebody. And I would ask you this week, take time to pray for them and fast for them. I'm going to make sure that next week, Sunday morning, I'm going to come fasted. To believe God for them, for their eternity. We want their soul to be saved. We want them to know Christ. At least, at least, like about one when you go to heaven. Think about it, how you will feel that day. When you stand before God and you see this one, and this one says, I wouldn't be here. Or somebody says, I, Bishop, listen. When the rich man and Lazarus died, the rich man who was in hell, the way hell was so bad, even if he was in pain, he became an intercessor immediately. He says to Abraham, Abraham, send Lazarus to my brothers on earth because they are living like the way I was living. And from the way they are living, they are going to come here. He became an intercessor. Hell is so bad that you become an immediate intercessor. Because even if you are there, whatever, I'm not coming out, but I wouldn't want anyone to come here. Like you always say, I will not wish this on my worst enemy. But Abraham's response was amazing. He says, oh, they can't send Lazarus. He says, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, labor or not, they will come here. Some of you, somebody is praying for you who's saying, if they won't listen to Bishop Musa, so they will also come here. Your soul is more valuable than wealth possession. Number two, in Matthew 16, 26, we know that the value of the soul corresponds to the value of life. Because life in God's terms is not just the material wealth. It goes beyond that. The soul on its own is your whole life. You know, we take all kinds of policies, life insurance policies, and life insurance policies, kinda, it doesn't talk about eternity. And it's a strange policy because it only happens when you are not alive. But I'm showing you a policy better than all other policies. And that is giving your life to Christ. Number three, when we value our soul, we will take care of it. Basalana, don't play with your soul. 
Take care of your soul. Thank God you are here in the church today to service your soul. You've put time aside on Sunday. You've pushed away all other engagements. You've switched off your phone, switched off your email. You've come here, you spend time, you spend money. You've placed yourself here because you want to take care of your soul. There are people who, this is not their discipline. This is not what they do. Go around and see people walking around. They couldn't care about their soul. They have no time for their soul. Because to them, life is about the things of the world. They don't realize that comes that day. And the sad part about the soul is that you have to make the decisions about the destiny of your soul when you are still in this body. Once you get out of this body, there's nothing you can do to change where you are going. So your soul is important. So your soul is valuable because it's eternal, it's immortal. It doesn't end. You live forever. Your soul is valuable because it is that part over which at least you have control. You can determine where your soul goes by the decisions you make. Even today, even right now, even in this service, you may be invited, you may have come on your own. Maybe you have been coming to church, but you haven't lived the life. You can determine where your soul goes. You can't blame on anybody. When we go to heaven, the blame game is going to stop. God will remind you. You know, I never knew this, Barcelona. I was talking to somebody the other time who was sharing with me how they got saved. And I was shocked because when they were talking about their story of how they got saved, it was so similar to my story. The day they got saved, in fact, it was a, 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 a Pastor Don Philip's son, Utrant. And he was saying to me, the day he got saved, that evening, it was like God played a video of his life and showed him everything about his life, things he had done, at least most of them, that had to do with being born again. And how he had lived, he had lived some life that was really not great. And then he got saved and God changed his life and God showed him his message. It was my first time to hear someone talk about that. So close, because he was transporting me when I was with Pastor Don Phillips. He was the one driving me around. We spent a great time with that young man. So I said to him, hey, I thought I was the only one. On the 5th of August, 1978, that evening when I went home, in a, in a second, Barcelona, God played a DVD of my life. Went as far back as I think when I was nine years old. I still remember. Nine years old, when we went to uh, AA to Cinema, which is no longer there. And AA to Cinema, my dad, who was a school teacher, had gone there with the students to go and watch a musical show by Percy Sledge. Now, you young people, you won't know who Percy Sledge is. <laughs> you can go and Google him. Percy Sledge, an American singer, had visited South Africa, and, and so they had gone there for the show, but because they were early, before the show started, then the young people from the SCM, which I didn't know what it was, started singing choruses. I didn't even know what a chorus was. And then they came to the front to come and give testimony. I didn't know what testimony was. Then they started talking about how they got saved, how they received Jesus, became the Lord of their life, how they got saved. And I'm nine years old and I'm sitting there. And I've been in church since I was six years old. I'm a religious guy. By God's grace, I come from a good home. Good father, who was a good example, good model. At home, we went to church every Sunday. I'd been to church. For three years of my life, I'd been to church, and I'm too young to have done anything wrong. I hadn't smoked. I hadn't womanized. I hadn't done anything. I didn't write. <laughs> but sitting there as a nine-year-old, I could tell that the way they were talking about Christ, it was so intimate. It was so real. It was so personal. Give me la paya. Even if I went to church, Christ was far away. That's why la 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 And I remember as a nine-year-old, I sat there and I said within myself, I want to know this Christ. I said it within myself. 
And from that age, as a nine-year-old child, I started searching. I searched. I mean, I've, I tried. I searched. I mean, I went to church, unfortunately. You know, even if preaching was done, these things were not explained to us. And even if powerful preaching was there, we were never given a chance to respond to the altar call. So I kept on searching. There's something about the soul. It will search for God. I tell you, it will search for God. And when you search for God, nothing else satisfies. When I got to be a teenager, I slipped into, I know now is depression. I didn't know what it was back then. And when I got to be 16 years old, I wanted to take my life. I just never had the courage to. Because I felt, I don't understand. I'm living right. I'm doing right. I'm going to church every Sunday. Mara, something ya short come. Something is missing in my life. I mean, I try my best. You know when you are religious, eh? And you're not born again. You try your best to connect with God. You know? Even with your most hardest of efforts, you still feel far from God. And thank God for the 5th of August, 1978, when I went to go and listen to preaching by Diamond Atong and a testimony by Ronald Pillay, on I shall And when this guy explained how he got saved, all of a sudden I realized, this is what I've been looking for. Like some of you already know, this is what I've been looking for. Yeah. It was not in a church building. He wasn't speaking proper language. But I knew as he spoke that this is what I was looking for. And on the 5th of August, 1978, like I'm going to give you a chance right now in a short while. When they said those who want to receive Christ must raise their hands, I raised my hand. And we were taken outside and I was counseled by Mike Machisa and led to Christ. And, and I went home with my elder sister, Auslodin, who had invited me. And for those two weeks, I knew something had happened. I couldn't explain it. I didn't have the verse for it. I, I, I didn't know how to say But I knew I'm not the same Musa Sono. On that day, I knew I'm not the same as Asona. Two weeks later, the late Mandla Adonis came to my home to come and do follow-up. So we must do follow-up. When he came there, he said, look, we got your name. That's why we write the addresses of the people. To visit them. Because after they're saved, if you don't follow them up, they don't know what happened to them. I'm telling you, they don't know what happened to them. You can't say if a police They don't know what happened to them. I didn't know what happened to me. So he came in, he sat down at my home, and he said, Last week, do you know what happened to you? I said, No. Well, they explained. He explained and told me about a Bible study that was there, Komoroka, read by, led by Jerem Fuking. And I must go there to you know, attend a Bible study. And I went there, and that's where I met my friends, you know, Spiwe Zuma, the late Jerry Lichella, Musa Zuma, some of the people who were there, Shimiko too. So I got to meet them. There we met in this youth club, Niko Mazui. We were there in this youth club and being taught, and every Wednesday there was a Bible study. And I started growing. And I realized there's a difference between being a churchgoer and being born again. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, a religious leader, he said, Nicodemus, I tell you, you must be born again. And so, as I close today, I want you to know that that soul, you have control over it. The soul does not exist, does not cease to exist at the point of death. And God is concerned about your soul. Look at 2 Peter 3, 9. He's concerned about your soul. Just two more scriptures and I'm closing. Listen what it says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us what not willing that any should perish, but that you should come to repentance. God doesn't want you to perish. And finally, your soul is important because it is measured 
by the great price of his redemption. God paid a big price for your soul. First Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. Listen to what it says. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain converse, conversations or lifestyle, which you received by the traditions from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Your soul is so precious that not, there's not enough silver, not enough gold, not enough diamonds, not enough precious stones that can buy it and save it. It is so precious that only another life could buy your soul. And only the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's why when we stand before God, nobody will have an excuse. Because Jesus came and died for all. Now, what do I want to ask you? What's the condition of your soul? What's the condition of your soul? You don't become born again by being born in a Christian family. Don't kid yourself. You don't get born again just by coming to church. You don't get born again because you're a good person. You've got to make a decision, conscious decision, to say today, I want to ask Jesus. He says this in Romans chapter 10. If you will confess him with your lips and believe in your heart, you will be saved. In John 1, 12, as many as received him, you've got to receive him. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God. I'm going to call on you to come today. And I'm looking forward to this altar being full even next week. But I want to ask you where you sit. Is your soul saved? What will it profit you? To feel embarrassed to answer. To feel embarrassed to raise your hand. To feel embarrassed that others who thought you were okay, you were not okay. What will it profit you? To try and please human beings. And at the end of it, lose your soul. See, we are here in church. And this is a place where no perfect people are allowed. We only allow people who are broken. People who need God. People who are desperate. People who need to find their way. People who are not ashamed to admit their true condition. People who will respond to God and say, here am I. It would be a great mistake if we did all of this and never gave you an opportunity to respond to God by yourself. I want to ask you, is your soul saved? Are you sure? Because if you are not sure about it, you can settle that question today. Maybe you've been invited by somebody. And as you've been listening to God's word, you can hear God is speaking to you. I want to pray for you. This is the time for life change and life transformation. In the same way God changed me, the same way God transformed me, God wants to transform you as well. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? Everybody, nobody moving around, please. This is a holy moment. Christians, if you can, please, just pray softly right where you are. Because I know in this time, there's a tug of war between the powers of darkness and the powers of light. There's a tug of war for the soul of people. There are many voices that are trying to confuse them. Please don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to a voice that says you shouldn't respond. Listen to your heart. Listen to what God is whispering in your heart. If you know your life is not right before God, you don't need to wonder anymore. You can make things right with God right now in this place, right now. Our heads bowed, our eyes closed.
If you say, please pray for me, Bishop. My life is not right before God. My soul is not where it should be. Please pray for me. Would you raise your hand right where you are? I want to pray for you. Just raise it high. Don't be afraid. Even in all the branches where you are, raise your hand right there where you are. Don't leave it for tomorrow. Don't leave it for next week. This is the time. You are here now. You are alive today. You are in this place right now. God is speaking to you. Today when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let him speak to you. Thank you for those hands. Raise it up with everything in you. Raise it up with determination and say, God, here I am. Can I ask everybody who raised their hands, would you stand on your feet? All over this place, just stand on your feet. Thank you, 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 thank you. Oh, Jesus. All over the place, stand, stand, stand. Even in the overflow hall, stand, 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 stand. Listen, listen. I know there are still some of you who are still seated. You are still battling in your heart. You are still battling in your heart. Yeah, that's right. Just stand, just stand. If you've come with somebody, just tell them, look, I'll stand with you. I'll stand with you. Just go ahead and stand with them. I'll stand with you. I'll stand with you. I'll stand with you. There it is. Just stand with them. That's right. Encourage them. Stand with them. Stand with them. Stand with them. But Salana, it's worth, it is worth pursuing them. It is worth encouraging them. We don't want their soul to be lost. We don't want them to go into damnation. Encourage them. Encourage them. Tell them I will stand with you. You don't need to be afraid. I'll stand with you. I'll stand with you. I'll stand with you. Listen to me, Barcelona. The Bible says there's much joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. There's more than one person who is standing here. I think there should be a lot more joy in this church. I think we must encourage these people even more. Oh, yeah. One more time, I want to go around this place. If you are still out there, if you are still seated, the door is still open. The opportunity is still open. It is your time. It is your season. It is your moment. Just stand on your feet. Join these people. Stand on your feet. Don't, don't, don't sit down. Don't sit down. That's right. Right at the back there. God bless you. God bless you. One more person. One more person. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Say, here I am, God. Here I am, God. I want my soul to be saved. I want my soul. I see them right at the back. God bless you. God bless you. Basalan, I want to repeat it again. I want us to change this. In this church, when we see people do this, we must give them the loudest and the most excited clap ever and encourage them. Come on, encourage them. Come on, church. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. I want to pray for every one of you who is standing. I'm going to ask you if you can take all your belongings, please. All right, don't leave your belongings behind. I just want to meet you up in front here. Just walk all the way to the front. Come stand here, right here. I want to pray for you. Come on. 